ಕಂಸಾಚಾನುರಾಮರ್ತನಂ ದೇವಕಿ ಪರಮಾನಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂಡೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ವಿ ಸಲ್ಯೂಟ್ ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವರ್ ಟೀಚರ್ ಸನ್ ಆಫ್ ವಾಸುದೇವ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರಾಯ್ ಆಫ್ ಕಂಸ ಚನೋರ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಬ್ಲಿಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದೇವಕಿ ಸೊ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಆರ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಮೆನಿ ವೀಕ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಗವದ್ ಗೀತಾ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಫಿನಿಶಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಇಲೆವೆನ್ ದಿ ವಿಶ್ವರೂಪ ದರ್ಶನ ಯೋಗ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮೇಕಿಂಗ್ ಎನ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ಟು ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಟ್ವೆಲ್ ಆಸ್ ಯು ಶೋ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಟು ಟೇಕ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ಸ್ ಸಿ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಇಲೆವೆನ್ ಆಸ್ ವಿ ನೋ ದಿಸ್ ಇನ್ಕ್ರೆಡಿಬಲ್ ಕಾಸ್ಮಿಕ್ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಇಸ್ ದೇ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟೆಲ್ಸ್ ಅಸ್ ಮೆನಿ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ವಿ ಬೀನ್ ಥ್ರೂ ಇನ್ ವೇರಿಯಸ್ ವೀಕ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಪಾಸ್ಟ್ ದಟ್ life is not necessarily smooth nature has some violent aspects to it some disruptive aspects to it but we have the comfort of knowing from our vedanta philosophy that when we get to that point of unity of existence all of these other things the whole universe with all its complexities and at the human level its doubts its temptations all disappear and how do we get such a vision or any other kind of internal vision that seems supernatural to us the answer is by unswerving devotion bhaktya tananya shakya kaham evam vido arjuna jyatam tushtam cha tat tena praveshtam cha parantapa what then is the direct and sure path in any endeavor and spiritual life the statement comes by unswerving devotion can i of this form be known and seen in reality and also entered into or scorch of faults not seen as an independent entity but entered into also and scorch of faults you see param tapa that is that we all have the potential arjuna representing us all we have the potential to scorch our enemies do away with them ruthlessly and effectively what are our enemies our primary enemy is egoism i do this i do that as soon as this concept of i comes in we've now made a separation and the truth is that there's only one thing spirit there's only one thing that exists anywhere and that is spirit but how is it we don't know it is because we make this separation the mind has a dividing faculty that fragments everything all of this we have covered in the past and this unswerving devotion this bhakti this bhakti yoga this is the subject that is the speciality of chapter 12 Of course all of these verses from the 7th chapter onwards have been dedicated to the subject of worship. Now there are many who say and make a decision on the basis of the sense of individuality. I think my path is this, I think my path is that. But why is bhakti yoga so emphasized and why is it so emphasized in this day and age by Sri Ramakrishna? is a good question should we not give equal value to all the other approaches and of course by one or more or all of these and be free says swami vivekananda so we should incorporate all of them but we may have a tendency toward one or the other and this tendency can be a trap how so you see supposing my major blocking mechanism to do with my egocentric position is that i'm out of touch with my feelings It means i can lack compassion and i might be orientated toward just the principle of something then spiritual life for me becomes just an abstract academic pursuit something like intellectual gymnastics supposing my nature is to be critical of the world critical of myself critical of everything and take 
life in a very serious way, not as a play of waves, not as a drama, not as a cosmic dance, not as a thing that will disappear once our full knowledge of illumination comes. Supposing that's our position, then what will be our approach to the world? It will be callous, it will be critical, it will be an area that wants to correct everything. And then, as I say very frequently, our strategy will be, and our opinion about God will be, this is a, some entity that somehow purposelessly made a number of gaps and holes and putting it in a funny way, that Lord of the Universe sitting there in his heaven, been there since Genesis, a little senile now. Mm -hmm. We have to complete everything for him. He made a very bad job. We could make a better world. Mm -hmm. He made a world full of holes. What is his purpose? Making holes. What will he do in the cosmic tomorrow? Fill them in. What a useless thing. And then we duplicate it and say, what is our role? To notice these holes, like the roads department, and fill them. And as often as we fill them, more holes develop. It's the looking for holes and trying to fill them that gives us the great frustration. We'll never come to an end to it. But God made the world and so it was good. How is it that we see it's bad? How will you try and make a correction? So it all depends on this aspect of love. Love means we have to love the world. We have to love ourselves. We have to love all existence because there's only one thing there. This world is a play of and play of various waves of various types and forms and frequencies. We have to develop a love for it. Since it is only one thing, pure spirit. And that pure spirit comes to us conveniently in a great form. And the form is not chosen by us. The form that we have is chosen by how we want to adopt a mood, a bhava. We have a choice. We can position ourselves as a child. What's the advantage of this? We can then let go. And we don't take life so seriously now because everything is in the parents' hands. Let's say we view it as a mother. The child is quite happy to be carried by the mother. It doesn't question, will you carry me? It doesn't doubt the reliability of being carried. It simply lets go like a kitten. Two ways are there, we know. The way of the monkey, the way of the kitten. Scrambling on for desperate life is the monkey's way. Being thrashed around here and there, and the mother doesn't seem to care, jumps here and there, climbs trees, jumps from tree to tree, branch to branch. And whether the baby is on, on the back or not, the monkey seems oblivious to it. And the monkey has its own concerns. We find this comparison of monkey mind also. On the way to our um, uh, Utikamanda on this last pilgrimage trip, we went through a park and there we stopped and uh, carelessly left the window of the car down and soon, as soon as uh, the opportunity arose, a monkey curiously looked in. Didn't worry where its babies were. Its mind was highly concentrated, actually. Seeing that the window was down, it looked around and uh, looked to see whether it was being looked at. <coughs> Before we knew it, jumped through the window and then into the back seat. Now it can't escape. I opened the back door. Now it has escape route. And it got one thing, a small packet of biscuits this size and deftly opened it, consumed it, and I'm not sure whether it put the, kindly put the paper in a waste paper basket mm -hmm. or simply threw it. No way of knowing it. This is the nature of a monkey, carelessly going about things, but with a certain self-interest in mind, 
And what about the baby on the back? And so bhakti yoga is about learning to let go and be carried. And in that being carried, we can find full expression of our feelings. And a peace of mind that says, we will always be reliably carried from destination to destination. Unasked, we can see how nature, our mother, has provided for us fully. Digestion of food, conversion of energy into the matter that we call a body, giving us pocket money for thinking, pumping the heart, giving us an environment for breathing, not, not an environment full of carbon or nitrogen or anything like that, with a wonderful mix of chemicals, of gases, that can easily be, in a respiratory way, digested. And then that then gets carried through the hemoglobin throughout the whole body. Liver functioning by itself. You don't have to make any directives or commands in the morning. Please, will you do this? Do you, please, will you do that? Please, will you filter everything out for me? You know, a liver is something that is vital for life. That's why it's called a liver. It has multiple functions, not just one. Every other organ of the body only has one function. But the liver has multiple functions. Vital thing. We don't even think about it. And so, therefore, unwittingly, we have surrendered, taking for granted that all these things will happen by themselves. And then what a sweetness there is. So the language is like this, this devotional language. By unswerving devotion, single-minded me, anyaya, single-minded devotion. Now, can any of us say that this is true of ourselves in our normal daily life, that we have single-minded concentration toward one thing. Suppose you have a single-minded love for something. We do find it from time to time, although it fades, in human relationships. Biology has designed some kind of inner madness that takes place amongst young people with the urge to mate, as all biological species do, we find much of our hormones dedicated to seeking out a partner. And you know the ritual. A little conversation. The ritual has probably changed these days because the internet is now available, but is to strike up some conversation based on a mutual interest and then try and peer at each other through very weak kind of light supplied by candles and then you know uh, holding hands and you know all the rituals that go with us but you see it's all of a temporary nature when we get fully involved with it then we become obsessed this is young teenage love and it is immature love in a sense and yet it has a sweetness and the sweetness matures into a kind of love which says we are aware of each other's company in old age and we are happy and we are mutually satisfied that the other will always be there as a presence. So we have all these different examples and analogies from our own human life to say how does this work and to give us a clue about the bliss and sweetness of this path of devotion. But single-minded, yes, we find this kind of relationship single-minded. We were talking about this with a group of people a few weeks ago. You see, supposing now you're sitting here and you get some kind of intimation from Australia to say uh, some cousin is, con is contacting you. And the cousin then has never heard of you previously, but did a genetic study and family study and found, I have a relative in Ireland. And the relative I managed to trace, it's you, contacts you. Then you gain an interest. Yes, it'd be nice to find a relative in Australia. You start corresponding. You have no idea what the other looks like. It's only a written communication. The distance is vast. Australia, the distance is vast the other end of the world. 
they sit in an upside down position on the globe from our point of view. Then you see, the next thing is, you become good friends, but you still don't know each other. And so the one invites you, says, here's a picture of me, now you have a visual connection. But then you go to Australia and you meet face to face and your friendship develops more and your kinship develops more and when it's time for you to depart there's a certain sorrow that goes with it, a certain regretfulness that goes with it, a certain sadness goes with it. And then once you've gone, it's fair to say that you know this person well. And it doesn't stop there, the connection remains. When all the direct apostles of Sri Ramakrishna went their own ways in a wandering way to do tapasya, severe penance and austerities, one was asked, one namely Swami Brahmananda, whose birthday was the other day, he was asked by somebody who knew him well, Vijay Goswami actually, look, you've lived under the great, great grace and shadow of this master, the embodiment of light. You surely caught the light here. What need is there for you to do tapasya? And Brahmananda replied, no, what we gained, I want to get permanently. I want to have it permanently. I don't want it to fade. And so this requires constant attention, a constant cleansing, not just a casual thing, not just a casual encounter, a deep relationship that deepens every day and that echoes what should be there in spiritual life, namely a, an intensification, a daily intensification, a deepening of your spiritual endeavor, your spiritual experience, not being satisfied with the status quo. How is your spiritual life? How is your meditation? How are you doing your japa? All these inquiries are often made by a teacher. And the reply is varied. Oh, I, I forgot my to do my japa. So not only are you know, we not maintaining a status quo, but it's going down. It's declining. Or, yes, yes, no, it's going fine. What does that mean? Yes, I'm doing it every day. But are you deepening it every day? Is your love deepening? Is your heart expanding? Because the real love of God will be an expansion that incorporates all existence. It's that level. Since there's only one entity there, only one spirit, the heart should expand and generously embrace everything. And so this language is very carefully constructed. And we are told, therefore, that unswerving devotion, where the mind does not swerve in its concentration, remains there, fixed. There's an attraction there. One name for God is Hari, the one that we are attracted to. We are attracted to this entity, in Ramakrishna's language, like steel or nails, being attracted to a magnet. And so, Sri Krishna goes on, and there's a small commentary on this, as we finish up this 11th chapter, he says, many have heard of milk. In the example of locating a cousin, many have heard, there's a relative in Australia. And those who have seen it, these are less in number. But the partakers of milk are lesser still. But even such is the contact of man with God. You may have heard of the substance milk. Then you may have seen a photograph of it. Then you may have seen milk itself. And then you have tasted. Only when you've tasted it will you be able to say, ah, this is milk. I've now experienced it. It becomes incorporated as part of my experiential scene. A talk arose where the man can see God with his physical eyes. No, he cannot be perceived with fleshy eyes. You see, how do we grasp this entity that has no moving parts, no change in the evolutionary process beyond the scope of our understanding? And so we need easy methods. Supposing we embark, literally speaking, 
on the path of jnana, for example. Uh, some of you have been, and uh, it, right now one of our devotees is there in Arunachal or thereabouts, in the place of Ramana Maharshi, who dedicated his life to an inquiry, self-inquiry. Inquiry went relentlessly. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Until the self was known and discovered. But how did he do it? He sat in a cave for years. Are you prepared to do this? Are you prepared to give everything up? Go and sit in a cage, cave and relentlessly ask this question, do this introspection, dedicate your whole life to do it. Is this feasible? Is it possible in this day and age? Of course, everything is possible. There are some people who lead a contemplative life like this. There are some people whose nature is drawn toward that. But the normal, so-called normal people have a life to lead. And as long as you have emotion in you, you have the capacity and the necessity to take all that energy and consciously, systematically direct it in a certain way, namely love of God. So all these things are discussed in these chapters. And chapter 12 particularly refers to this and compares specifically these two parts. And so a talk arose where the man can see God with his physical eyes. No, he cannot be perceived with fleshy eyes when bhakti is practiced. The sadhaka, spiritual practitioner, develops a superior sense organ. And that has the power to see and hear super mundane things. With that spiritual eye, God is beheld and the devotee is commingled with him. So then the question arises, what should the spiritual practitioner do? We're all spiritual practitioners. Uh, those who have taken it up consciously are more specifically sadhakas or spiritual practitioners. And the injunction comes there. He who does work for me, who looks on me as the Supreme, who is devoted to me, who is free from attachment, who is without hatred for any being, he comes to me, O Pandava. This is pure bhakti. So it says, Mat kamarkran, mat paramo, mat bhaktaha, sangha varjitaha, nevairaha sadha bhuteshu, ya sa mam eti pandava. See, it's the nature of beings to work. There's the phrase, busy bee. We all have to be a busy bee, not a busy body, by the way. Busy bee, different. So worldly people survive for prosperity, and this day and age, all of us need work. All of us need to be busy. That means we have to convert our activities in a spiritual way. All the energies which are there, diverted toward work and activity, whatever it is, your duty, your speciality, your gift of employing your own skills, all of this has to be transformed into something that reveals and directs us and moves us toward our ultimate purpose. This chapter ends like this, but Sri Ramakrishna gives a final comment. Do you know what kind of devotion we ought to have towards our Maker? The love of a chaste wife to her husband, the attachment of a miser to his hoarded wealth, the craving of a worldling for sense pleasures, all these rolled into one and directed towards the Lord makes bhakti. We shall truly gain him in this way. And this is where it's worth repeating because it's highly creative and imaginative. We can all relate to this. So the love of a chaste wife to her husband, we can imagine that. See how the selected terms are there. A chaste wife to the husband. If you look in the family, any family, regardless of where it is, and find out who's the real boss in the family, you'll find it's the wife. Even though the man may not admit it, because you see, the man has a problem. It's called, I lost my socks. And with this loss of socks, it is the wife who finds it, see? It's the wife who behaves 
like a mother also, the chaste wife. The attachment of a miser to his hoarded wealth is an exaggerated example. But when we bring it into the context of our own life, we have to ask ourselves, are we also attached to our wealth in the form of assets or in the form of money or even in the form of a shoe or a sock, something that we possess? The test of it is, supposing we took all that and gave it all to charity, where would we be? Would we be happy to do that? In a way, are we not all misers? And then the craving of a worldling for sense pleasures. Everybody who lives in the world can be described in this way. And everybody is attracted toward all the pleasures, from small pleasures to radically obsessive pleasures. And you can identify which one and which area is yours, a compensation, as it were, for not finding fulfillment in the life, which is there if we notice it and tune into it. So all these rolled into one thing. Imagine now the intensity of this. This is really bhakti. And bhakti yoga will naturally overflow into a sense of generosity and a spirit of service for all beings. And so iti srimad bhagavad gita supa supanishatsu brahma vidyayam yoga shastre shri krishna arjun Samvale Vishwarupa Dashana Yoga Nama Ekadasho Jaya in the Supanishad of the Bhagavad Gita. Knowledge of Brahman Supreme, Science of Yoga, Dialogue between Sri Krishna and Arjuna. This is the eleventh discourse designated the Yoga of the Vision of the Cosmic Form. So now that gives us the end of this chapter, it gives us an automatic overlap an introduction to chapter 12. And chapter 12, of course, is called Bhakti Yoga. Having heard from Sri Krishna this great sweetness and this concentratedness of effort and energy called this Bhakti Yoga, then we come across a question. So Arjuna asked this question that all of us could ask. Arjuna Vacha Ivam Satat Yukta Ye Bhaktas Tom Paryo Pashati Ye Cha Pyak Sharam Avyaktam Tesham Ke Yoga Vitamaha. So Arjuna says, Ask this question. Having heard this, the last message there, those devotees who, what, ever steadfast, worship you in this way, which way, thus, the, one, the way in which you've just described. And those again who worship the imperishable, the unmanifest, which of these are better versed in yoga? There are a number of ways we can put this question. Those who follow the path of bhakti yoga, or those who follow the path of jnana yoga, those who follow the path of the heart, or those who follow the path of the head, those who want a form, or those who are quite content with a formless, amorphous presence. Which of these? And this is because of the conclusion of the last chapter. Adoration of the Supreme was advocated. And we wouldn't say that the Lord is wasting his time and breath. There must be a reason why he's advocating this. But, on the other hand, Brahman, the Supreme Principle, this pure spirit that is the only existence, is both with and without attributes. And we find this omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, all good. The words of the Quran says at every surah, it says, the beneficent, the all-beneficent, the all-merciful, and so on. The ever-just, all of these are attributes. So of these two aspects of his, which is better suited for worship? Because all of it requires worship. Even a jnana yogi will set up an ideal and move toward it. And so this is the point raised here in for clarification. 
And so, Sri Bhagwan Uvacha, blessed Lord, replies, Maya Vesha Mano Yemam Nitya Yukta Upasate Sraddhaya Parayo Pritas Te Me Yukta Tapma Mataha The blessed ones, those who have fixed their minds on me, that is the personal entity with form and, and qualities, and who ever steadfast, that means not shaking from it, not being deviating from it, compiling all his energy and steering it in one direction, and endowed with supreme shatta, faith. Faith means it's all yours. Don't say you have a problem. Take it like a telephone call. Lord, it's for you. Take all your problems and difficulties, because what you've done is you put yourself in a reliant position, a position of dependency. If it's over-dependency, it's dangerous, it's weakness. To hold on to a sense of independence on the one hand, and yet to submit to the divine will on the other. To be prepared to be carried, because you are being carried whether you know it or not. It's not you that can assert, I am breathing. You don't push the chest like a pair of bellows and say, I am breathing. It doesn't work like that. So endowed with supreme shraddha, worship and worship, faith, faith in yourself, faith in God, faith in the teacher, these are the classical ways of describing shraddha. But in this case, complete, complete faith in this divine entity. Worship me, them do I consider perfect in yoga. There's your answer. Of course, another alternative is offered. But if you just leave it there, it becomes an out-of-context thing. So the Lord is having a cosmos for his physical body. That we understood from chapter 11. It's not that there's a creator and something separate creation. That entity is the efficient and material cause that carries through. That entity has manifested the universe from his own self. And so, his physical body, he is the Param Parameshwara, the Supreme Lord, Saguna Brahman, Brahman with qualities and conditions, incorporating time and space and causation and function. He rules remaining imminent in the universe. He is the Lord of the Yogis. These are all various descriptions. He's the Omniscient. His devotees are they who have dedicated themselves to his worship. Thinking of him day and night, dedicating all activities as if there were ritual items being offered. All your work, all your penship, all your computer stuff, all your travel, all your interaction with clients or with other people or with family, all of this converted to worship. <coughs> His devotees are they who de have dedicated themselves to this worship and they are free from attachment, aversion and angularities. Everybody has to detach. How do you detach? Easy. Make an attachment. Somebody asked me, how do I get over an addiction? You create another addiction, a better one. If we become addicted to God, make God our magnificent obsession, the world naturally falls by itself without being changed, without being attacked, without having some strategy toward it. Renunciation being there, we don't have to consciously, deliberately do it. When you love something, someone, the little loves for everything else fall away. Replacing all the little loves with one grand love. This is Bhakti Yoga. And so, thought of the Lord alone dominates their hearts. Day and night, they live for the service of the Lord. They are therefore perfect yogis. Makes sense. Now Sri Ramakrishna says this. It's quite all right to meditate on God, viewing him as formless. He's anticipating the other half of this answer. But do not entertain the thought that only your conception of God is correct and that the beliefs of the others are erroneous. In every con conversation, more or less, with a newcomer to 
Ramakrishna that comes within his field, he asked this question, do you believe in God with form or without? This was the question that was raised to Mahendra Mem, M in the Gospel. And he was shocked and surprised. Can you have a God with form and formless? I prefer God with, without form. That's very good, says Sri Krishna. But don't think that that alone is true. God with form is also true. And this was a new concept to M. And so, to meditate on him as with form is also a method. You persevere staunchly in your path until you reach the realization of God. After that, you will come to know that all paths lead to the same goal. By meditating on God with form, you attain the formless. By meditating on the formless, if you can, you perceive the form. And where is the form ultimately? The form is every form that you see. Are they not yogis who take to the adoration of the attributeless, the absolute reality, the jnana yogis, the nirguna brahman? So the answer is now given, because we can't leave it there. Yetvaksharam anirdesham avyaktam paryupasate sarvatra gam achintam cha kutashtam achalam dhruvam but those who worship the imperishable, the indefinable, the unmanifest, the omnipresent, the unthinkable, the unchangeable, the immovable, the eternal, you get the idea? Here comes the one thing. Having restrained all the senses, there's the condition. Even-minded everywhere, engaged in the welfare of all beings, truly they also come to me. You see, very often, Hinduism, was accused of not being socially orientated. But here comes, for a second time mentioned, by the way, in this Bhagavad Gita, that those people who are restrained in their senses, even-minded everywhere, engaged automatically in the welfare of all beings, not secluded in a cave somewhere, but working for the welfare of all beings. What is the value of a sannyasa? What is the value of a sadhu? They are givers. That means when you resort to them, they become protective. They become your rest house. They become your protection. You take refuge in them. This is the quid pro, the, the mutual exchange that takes place. That a sannyasin has given up everything, but you take refuge in him because he has an abundance within him, a fullness that can spread to you and bless your life, welfare of all beings, because that love is there. So it goes like this. Samniyamye nindriya gramam savatra samabhutaya te praptu vanti mam eva Salva Bhutta Hite Rataha. Having restrained all these senses, supposing you say this is the path for me, very good. Have you restrained all your senses? Are all your senses under control? Are all your avenues to the external world fully under control? Even minded everywhere. Do you see that this entity, which is called Brahman, is working through as a kind of energy? All hands, all eyes, all heads, everywhere, like a huge, huge cosmic machine with God's grace flowing through it. Is this what you see? If that's the case, no room for criticism, no room for adjusting or changing. Love everywhere. And when you say in all, you're ex not excluding yourself. There's no egoism involved. Just as when Sri Ramakrishna was there in Kashipur garden house and he couldn't eat and he was his disciple begged him won't you eat something won't you eat something for our sake won't you eat then he said let me ask the mother if I can eat something please won't you ask the mother that you can eat something then he went off like a child came back with a 
a retort, assuming that they were kind of devils, devilish you, you're playing tricks here now because actually the my, <coughs> my, my Divine Mother has said, what you want to eat through this when you're eating through so many mouths? Every mouth is yours, don't you know it? So, engaged in the welfare of all beings, truly they also come to me. They also come to me. Now we have plus one, plus one. Those who think and worship the personal form of God with love and devotion, devoting all their energies to worship of a personal God, they come to me. They are perfect in yoga. But those who follow this Nirguna Brahman, those who follow this impersonal, they also come to me. See, Nirguna Brahman is indeterminate pure consciousness. It's arrived at by this process of elimination. In 1880, confronted with something that we experience, we now put it through an analysis process and say, is this real? No, this is not permanent. This is not permanent. This is not permanent, this is not permanent, this is not permanent. In this way, we come to what is there. But there's no ego in this, because all of this is the body as well. This here. You are putting it into a cosmic milieu, or milieu, <coughs> if you like. A cosmic mix, and saying, this is all the same. It involves a, an element of detachment, complete detachment. These, this is the path for people of keen intellect and dedicated practice. So it can be arrived at by eliminating all obstructive modifications which are characteristic of this nature that we find, the scenes in front of us. The akshram is the imperishable. The universe of form appears and disappears. But pure consciousness itself is ever itself. It never changes. If we can peer through everything and see this pure consciousness, you see, seeing is an intellectual term, feeling it, feeling one with it. And so, aniya desha means the indefinable. You can't define it. Any effort will result in failure. And it's also avyaktam, it's unmanifest. And so, also, the description here, salvatragam, means omnipresent. A lump of ice buried at the bottom of the sea remains ever unmanifest and unrecognized. It's because of concealment somewhere in this way that Brahman is unmanifest. And then unthinkable. All these things are there, all these descriptions are there. Unchangeable, immovable, and eternal. So the spiritual aspirant who is competent to adore the formless reality Competent means restrain all the senses, even-minded everywhere, engaged in the welfare of all beings, all simultaneously. That's the competent one. To adore the forms of reality has the following attainments. He has complete mastery of the senses. And complete mastery of the senses means that he neither runs after the pleasant nor recoils from the painful just even-minded in any circumstances, any ups, any downs, but remains unaffected by both of them because they're both in the classification of unreal, impermanent. So does the sadhaka or the spiritual practitioner reduce himself then to the position of a corpse, completely detached in this way, completely immune, and therefore not compassionate. Completely unaffected by pleasure and pain, no, he raises himself to even-mindedness which is found in him only, who is ethically and spiritually evolved. <coughs> Evolution is an unfolding from within, carefully cultivated with obstacles removed in such a way that this flow takes place. This attitude, again, doesn't mean passiveness. Very often the question arises, you see this Advaita, if everything is only one, there's no need to do anything. You can just lie in bed the whole day. So that's a difficulty 
very often a misunderstanding. Not at all. Because whether you lie in bed or not, you still think you're embodied. You're still an ignorant person. And even more so, because you enter into a state of morbidness and dullness. So this attitude again does not mean passiveness. It expresses itself in the form of service to all beings, this welfare of all beings. That's the mark. That's how we know. And why is that so? Because recognizing the divinity in them, through them, as them and beyond them. And when the sadhaka's mind flows out in this way, recognizing Godhood everywhere, it is to be regarded really in this sense as worship of Brahman. That is the worship. It's not the ritualistic worship, but this welfare of all beings, that's the worship. And so Sri Ramakrishna says when a bell is rung, each stroke, ha stroke has a sound form of its own. But the formless sound is also heard for a while after stopping the striking. This is from his own experience. And similarly, in the same way, God is both with form and without form. Striking the bell, form. And then the sound form of its own, the form of sound is also heard reverberating after you've struck it. A very good analogy. So if both ways of worship are one and the same, you can choose either or, isn't it? They both seem to be equal. You can adopt any method according to one's liking. Is that the case? No. One should not. And why? Klesho dikatarastesham avyakta shakta chetasham avyakta hi gatiya dukham deha vagbhye avapyate See, the difficulty is this. The difficulty is greater for those whose minds are set on the unmanifested. For the goal of the unmanifested is very hard for the embodied to reach. As soon as we feel, I have a body, I am so-and-so. As soon as we feel that, then we have an obstacle to discovering this unmanifest. That's the problem. And so while the goal is the same for both ones, for each one, the worship of God without form, very difficult. Very difficult for the sadhaka, soaked in body consciousness. You see, people advocate, in some cases I've come across, this non-dualism, but it's all just theoretical. Because as long as they talk about it and still feel embodied, they're dualists. <laughs> you can't avoid it. So what to do with it? We take it as our advantage. We take it as an opportunity and follow this dualistic path in the beginning. So God is very difficult for the sadhaka soaked in body conscious if it's unmanifest. And he, as he thinks of himself with form, he cannot help thinking of his God also with form. We look at Anders' language. If we were buffaloes, we'd have a buffalo God. If we were fish, we'd have a fish God. Because we're human, we have to make a human God. It's just the nature of things. And so the worship of Sakguna Brahman is easy. And Sakguna Brahman and Nirguna Brahman are two aspects of the same thing, two sides of the same coin. One is unmanifest, the other one is manifest. They're both the same entity. He who adores Nirguna Brahman, one without qualities, without attributes, has to be free from body feeling right from the beginning. But the attainment of that state is not possible for all, for some it is. The spiritually advanced soul alone rises to that level. The easy and natural course for the ordinary sadhaka is to proceed with the worship of God with form. It's safe, it's sweet, renunciation is effortless because we are attracted toward the one. As soon as our love increases for God, our love for the world decreases proportionately. The jnani, says Sri Ramakrishna, or the realized soul says, Aham Brahmasmi, 
I am Brahman. But the body-bound man should not say this. It is harmful to him to say, I am Brahman. You find this everywhere. Those who have studied some Vedanta philosophy, the Advaitins, they say, Oh, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. No, the I that you're talking about is identified with your body. And so, it is harmful to say, I am Brahman, when actually he is the body. He deceives himself and the world by such a statement and creates much confusion. So how should the sadhaka or spiritual practitioner proceed with the worship of Ishwara, the way is shown in the subsequent stanzas? And I'll just deal with one for the time being. Yetu sarvani karmani mayi samyasya matparaha anye nayai va yogena mam jayanti upasati But those who worship me, renouncing all actions in me because I'm the owner of it, you have nothing to do with it. I'll allow you to take credit. Regarding me as the supreme goal, meditating on me, with single-minded yoga, single-minded concentration. It goes on, but we'll cover it more next week. So for them whose thought is set on me, and become, they become very soon, very quickly. It's a catalyst. O Partha, the deliverer from the ocean of the mortal samsara, this trap in which we are caught, which you call the world. And then the remedy is this. And we'll, go, uh, uh, we'll explore those two stanzas next week. And we'll go into some alternative methods, starting off with the most ideal, and then taking our humanity into account and seeing how we, in practice, can modify this. And we'll find there's a method for everybody. It doesn't matter how advanced or not advanced you are. It doesn't matter whether you've just seemingly started on a conscious spiritual journey or you're a seasoned traveler. There is something for everybody. And so we finish off this introduction to chapter 12, named Bhakti Yoga. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all.